Okay, we've got we've got quite a lot of you on, which is fantastic. So we'll start. So yes, welcome everybody. Good morning um, to this workshop on mobilising the education sector um, with LiftShare and Areva. Um, my name's Charlotte Albert. I'm head of partnerships um, at LiftShare. And um, we've got Sam Hunt, who's a key account manager at LiftShare, with us today as well, and Mike Kent um, from Areva. So just a couple of the usual um, housekeeping bits before we start. Um, this webinar uh, workshop is being recorded. Um, you are all on mute um, and your cameras are turned off though, so um, you, won't, you won't be seen. Um, but yeah, just to let you know, um, throughout um, this workshop, if you've got any questions at all, just pop them in the chat box um, that's there. You should all be able to see that. And we've got time for questions and answers at the end of the session. Um, so yeah, let's get going. Um, so yeah, thanks again for joining. I know it's a bit of um, a tumultuous time at the moment um, for everybody, um, the education sector particularly. I'm not sure if some of you have some of your students back um, and what your plans are. Um, but the purpose really of this session is um, to get thinking through some of the challenges that the education sector have in relation to transport. So um, just to sort of start off with why we're here. Um, we know that you know uh, schools, colleges, universities rely on bus networks, be that public and private, to get um, a lot of pupils um, to and from site. And with social distancing and the challenges that COVID nineteen have um, have shown, um, you know there are some things that need to be thought through. So we're really hoping through this workshop, which is interactive as well, we'll be doing a couple of polls and obviously the Q and A. Um, not only can you learn some things um, from ourselves at LiftShare and Areva on some tools and considerations you need to make, um, but we hope to learn about some of the challenges that you have as well. So, I hope we don't have any technical difficulties as well, because I'm not the most technically adapt person, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, so, just going through the agenda. So, um, we're just going to give you a quick overview of LiftShare and Areva. So, some of you will know us and Areva, but some of you won't. So, we'll just go through that. Um, we've got some insights into UK travel behaviour, so um, what, what's been going on in the UK to kind of frame what we're talking about in the wider context. Uh, we've got our first poll for you. Um, Sam and I will be taking you through um, the Happier Framework, which is essentially um, something that we've developed to work with organisations on mobility um, challenges, sustainability challenges. Um, some examples of work in practice. So, and putting that in context from a sort of an education perspective. Um, another poll to see where you guys are at and ask, ask another question. Um, we'll be looking at some of our specific tools that we've developed, some products and tools that we think would be really useful for you. Um, we'll have Mike from Areva talking about some insights from um, the, the bus um, industry. I've had a couple of emails already prior to the workshop with lots of questions around that. So I think that's going to be really, really interesting. So it's, uh, we're really, really glad to be on with Mike. Um, some further considerations and then we'll be doing the Q&A. So, this is quite slow to move. So here at LiftShare, so um, at LiftShare we're a social enterprise um, founded with the purpose of solving the world's mobility problems through sharing. So um, we have 700,000 public members um, who can post their journey, whether they're a passenger or have a spare seat in their car, and we facilitate a million shared journeys a month. Um, so our, um, our core, goal, uh, core goals are around um, saving organisations money, um, providing better access to work, cutting CO2 and um, congestion, connecting communities, and really it's about combating single occupancy vehicles, so taking vehicles off the road. So we have a public site, which I said, which we have 700,000 members, um, but we work with um, about 700 organisations throughout the UK doing private schemes, working with them on developing sustainability um, and mobility goals as well. I and mean, you can see some of the awards that we've won down there. Now, we've not typically, we work with universities um, and local authorities. We've not typically worked um, with schools and colleges simply because, um, you know, there hasn't been, or we've not been made aware of huge transport challenges where we've been able to help. Um, but obviously we partner with the likes of Areva, and through our chats with Mike and the team there, we understand that there are some issues um, and we think we could be really well placed to help you think through those. So we really hope that today will be useful. And over to Mike at Areva. Morning, everyone. It's good to see so many on the call and uh, also good to see some of our existing clients on too. And thank you for allowing a bit of time today to talk through some of the challenges 
Just a brief overview about ourselves. Um, Arriva Bus is owned by the Deutsche Bahn Group, which is German based. So typically mobility and transport is what we do. So that ranges from trains, buses, bikes, all sorts of different things. Just on the screen there, you'll be able to see how we're set up within the bus sector and where we operate. Um, so we do have some operations in London, uh, which is obviously franchised through um, TFL over there. But in the other areas, which you can see marked on blue on the map there, you'll see some insights into how many vehicles we've got, the routes, uh, how many passenger journeys we do per year. Where we come in uh, with myself and my team, uh, we work directly with businesses uh, to look at their routes, look at how we're performing against those, coming up with different options for ticketing, you know, reducing cars at, at you know, car parks or at the school gates, wherever it might be. Primarily within um, my team, the education sector makes up about 60 to 65% of what we do. So it's quite, well, it's a very important sector, not only for ourselves when we're talking through business to business, but also as a whole as well. Um, around about 55% of our passengers are classed in the younger age group, uh, i.e. students. So I think this is really important to talk through today on A, where we are here and now, but B, um, what could potentially, what challenges or opportunities could, could uh, come into play by September. So thank you for the little uh, time there, Charlotte. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so here we've got, just uh, gonna go into some, some background info. Um, we've got a, uh, an infographic here, which is published by the government. It's obviously, we're about a month behind there, but it's just to give you a view of um, the different modes of travel um, and, and how that's been affected by lockdown. So as you expect, um, as we're going into lockdown on the 23rd of March there, um, you know, everything has plummeted. Um, motor vehicles, people using their cars, has obviously gone on, up and up and up. I think what you'll have seen between now, um, uh, between May and now, is cars have really skyrocketed. Unfortunately, we were hoping that people would um, be using their cars less because they've discovered cycling. That has still gone up. People are still cycling more. Um, but cars are still being used and, you know, if you look at the, the government guidelines around to try to not use public transport, um, you know, that, that, could, that could play a role. Even um, coming on my street today um, during lockdown, it was, you know, I've got, it's all on street parking, you couldn't find a parking place and the, the road's pretty much empty today. So, see, so everybody is going back. Um, Mike can sort of talk a little bit more about what, where they've seen demand in this industry, but I think bus and tube have slowly gone up, but not at the rate um, that cars have. So, um, as I said, we have 700,000 members at LiftShare, and we put a survey out to them about a month ago, um, asking them about how they were planning to commute post lockdown. Um, so around half of those people that um, responded to our survey um, we're actually planning on changing their commuting habits when lockdown lifted. So the biggest shift that we saw, and this is just to give you an idea of, you know, um, I think I'm sure staff and students are slightly different, but they are obviously people part of the wider demographic. But um, yeah, so working from home was the biggest shift that we're seeing. So people looking at being more flexible. I think a lot of organisations um, and people that thought that they could only do, you know, their best work in the office. Um, that's been shifted and a lot of organisations are looking at what they can do to be more flexible. Um, that certainly has been great for me to be able to work from home. I guess for um, staff and teachers, um, that might be more difficult, but you know, um, you know like a lot of um, you're probably thinking about what you can be doing around digital classrooms. So that might play into that. Cycling, as we've talked about, um, to increase by 71%. Um, walking to increase a little bit by 8%. Although lift, people said they would be lift sharing less, um, people would said they were going to be driving alone, um, was that, that was going to decrease, um, so make of that what you will, and um, train and bus travel obviously to decrease slightly there, um, but yeah, the working from home um, and cycling sort of being the biggest things, if you're looking at an environment, you know, the environment, that's, that's really positive. So um, Sam actually found um, this on a, I think it was Peston, uh, the, the journalist, um, he presented some of these figures around, uh, I think this was, yeah, the National Foundation for Education Research um, surveyed some school leaders and around how prepared they were for the return to school. So looking at getting people to and from school, so that's around transport, 
uh, social distancing, etc. And they're getting pupils to and from school. 69% said they were not very prepared. Um, so yeah, some interesting figures there, and it would be um, would be good to see what you all think. So I believe that leads us nicely into our first poll. So this should come up on your screens in one second. And once I can see that everybody has voted, um, I will share the results. So how prepared do you feel in getting people's and staff to and from site once your organisation is uh, getting people back? Okay. Few more votes in. There's still a few of you to vote, but it's fine if you don't want to. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna end the polling there and share the results. Okay, so 20% of you not prepared help. 72% of you are somewhat prepared working through challenges. That's good. And 6% of you are very prepared. So that's, that's brilliant. Um, just interesting to see. Um, but hopefully, wherever you are in that cycle, we can add some value today. Okay. So the four core challenges, and I guess this is kind of um, condensing what was in the um, the pestilent infographic that you saw there that we see for schools. Um, so the social distancing challenge. So this forms part of a couple of different arenas. So obviously the transport challenge. So if you've got people coming in in buses, if you've got private school buses, again, Mike will go into this in a little bit more detail, but at the top of my head, a double-decker bus that you could previously have, you know, almost 80 people on. Um, free COVID, you can now have 20. So, you know, that's a challenge. Um, obviously in the school, outside of the school, again, I was working, walking past my former primary school this morning and I saw they had these signs up outside the school gates of wait here, wait here, wait here. There's a few kids there, very sweet. Um, the phasing and the staggering challenge. So, um, you know, are you looking at year groups coming in? How is that going to work with your staff? Are you talking to, you know, your local authority and local businesses about what they're doing about that as well? Because even if we're um, you know, even if you're looking at staggering, if everyone is doing exactly the same thing, are you going to still be, is there still going to be congestion at those times? So that's something to think through. The on-site challenge, so that's kind of looking at the other two um, elements around social distancing um, and the environment and wellbeing challenge. So as sort of I talked about at this share, we're um, all about empowering and helping organisations um, with environmental goals, that's also around wellbeing. Um, with the you know targets around um, net zero carbon, um, lots of public um, and private organisations are looking at ways that they can um, help shift change. Um, so we still see that as being something that's a priority for a lot of organisations we work with. Um, we also know that a lot of schools are involved in trying to um, you know combat um, childhood obesity, um, looking at active. Um, travel programs, how can you encourage that amongst your staff and student populations and um, we actually see uh, an opportunity at the moment to really push on active travel um, as another mode. Um, so although it's a challenge it's also an opportunity. And then where do you need help? So this goes, this will go into a framework that, that Sam will take you through in a minute. So sort of expanding from the core challenges, um, what are the kinds of considerations that you know we think you need to make and obviously if you've got any others that you think that you have or that other organisations should be and the education sector should be thinking through, please just put them in the, um, the chat box and we'll go through them later. But just to go through these, so do you know where all your staff and students live um, in relation to, to, your, to your site? Um, and what are their current transport options? How will social distancing affect public transport in your local area? What public transport services will be available? Will your staff, the students, want to travel on public transport? So obviously we've looked at those modal shifts of how people are now thinking about um, how they were getting to and from work, school. 
Um, do all of your staff and students have to be in at the same time? Will your staff and students be able to get to school at standard times? Will the local infrastructure cope if parents all decide to drive? Um, is there enough parking space if all your staff decide to drive in? Will you need to produce any mobility comms and materials or travel plans to inform people of their options in relation to your provision and capabilities? So I'm going to pass on to Sam, who's going to take you through some scenarios and our framework. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Charlotte. So uh, my name's Sam. Um, uh, I look after Key Accounts at Lifshire. Um, and as Charlotte said, I'm just going to run through some uh, some client scenarios now. So this one, I believe, is particularly pertinent. Um, the reason being that it encapsulates all four of the core challenges that Charlotte's just mentioned. So if I just run through, we have 1,500 students and 150 staff. We have 40 parking spaces, rely heavily on the local public transport network and have heavy congestion around the school during drop-offs and pick-up times. The first phase, we're looking at year one, three and six, as well as children of key workers to return. And the second phase is still unknown. So we want to ensure that students and staff are able to get to school and feel safe in doing so. Now, the social distancing challenge relates to public transport. You know, how will the network stand up if social distancing measures remain in place? The phasing and staggering challenge is referenced in the different start times, the different year groups. On-site challenge, as Charlotte said, the car parks, um, congestion at the school gates and, and the well-being challenge obviously really really important how do people actually feel how do parents feel in sending their children back to school and, and how do staff feel in, in going back to school so if we go on to the next slide we're going to run through the happier framework which we have developed to help organizations get the right solutions but before we do so i'm just going to talk you through a couple of products and services that will feature so scoping smart mobility is a tool that we've created where we take anonymous postcode data and run it through our program and we produce a, a full comprehensive report. This gives you the full mobility landscape and you can see on the right hand side on the infographic the various modes that we combine to create a fully multimodal report. Important for two reasons. One is it can help you create a COVID-19 travel plan to reduce risk, to make it as safe as possible for people to get to, to and from school, university or college. But two, to create transparency and instill confidence equally as important. And in the context of public transport specifically, this can be used for route development. So, uh, for instance, if you have this report done and handed to a river, they can use it to assess feasibility of adjusting existing routes or even introducing new ones. So, uh, like I say, if social distancing measures remain in place, how will the network cope? And if it's not going to cope, then we need to understand where the demand is and we need to plan now. So on the next slides, you will see a couple of user stories, which I think are pretty relevant. Um, I'm just going to run through them quite quickly. So I know my staff are planning on changing their commuting habits after the lockdown lifts, and I need to understand all the options that they can use to get to work that adhere to social distancing guidelines. I employ hundreds of people, but I have no idea how I can improve their commute to work and encourage more sustainable modes of travel. The public transport infrastructure is poor for our employees. We need to evidence commercial viability to our local service providers to formulate a business case for improved routes and stops. So hopefully at least one or two of those rang some bells for some people listening. On to the next slide is my PTP. This is a, a personal travel planning tool that some or lots of you may already be aware of. It's a multifunctional travel planning tool and we've actually updated it in line with COVID-19. So the orders are now delivered in the order of social distancing guidance. This is a really good tool for active travel. So uh, it will highlight to you the calories that you save, um, that you burn, sorry, by walking and cycling, but equally the CO2 that you can save by not getting you in your car. One of the uh, challenges that we foresee is actually keeping everybody aware of all the options that they have as they change. Clearly the guidelines are changing on a daily basis um, uh, and, and the travel options are gonna change as well. So a tool like this could allow parents, they can allow staff to use it at their convenience and find out what the options are that are available to them in real time. As promised, the Happier Framework, like we said, it's a, a framework that we've created to help organisations work through challenges and embed the right solutions. So it's designed using agile methodology. So over short sprints, it's cyclical, so you can repeat the process and make iterations each time. 
And that's why we believe it's particularly well suited to the current crisis, because you can make changes when the facts change. For instance, if the two metre distance reduces to one metre, which I think we can all uh, imagine may happen quite soon. On the next slide, we, you'll see the, the start of the happier framework. So help and assess. Help is all about identifying what the challenge is. So you can see a couple of examples that we have listed here. The impact of social distancing on access to school. The impact of staggered starts. Now this isn't just staggered starts actually at the school, but also what happens if parents' workplaces decide to introduce staggered starts as well. Um, uh, there's gonna have to be a reckoning there at some points. And also the need for transparency to support plan and assess risk. In terms of assess, you can see there that we've listed scenario-based scoping. Um, to assess, we'd say get the scoping report done, get the full mobility landscape, get that full picture and understand where your staff and pupils live and how they can travel. Who can we target for active travel? Also gauge how your parents and staff feel. That's really, really important and combine all that with the survey data. Um, uh, com sorry, combine that with the data and the intelligence from scoping. On the next slide, you will see plan and implement. So, uh, so plan, like I've said, use scoping to talk to your public transport operator, have a dialogue with them based on data. We may need new routes or to adjust existing ones. Maybe set up a lift share scheme. This might not be the option that you choose to push in September, but it may become relevant as and when the guidelines change and plan active travel campaigns at all. Obviously there's loads of work been doing at the moment with local authorities to make active travel possible. So uh, we can start now planning those campaigns if we know who actually has a genuine chance of, you, of, of doing active travel. And implement, so uh, this might be about installing extra bike racks for instance, but it's also about effective communications, making people aware of what their options are when they change. And like I say, you can use travel plans to do this. Analyze and review. To analyze, simply put, is this working? So you can see here we've listed, there is enough bus provision and people can still use the buses and still be social distance. There is a contingent of parents who share the drop-offs, the bike racks are being used, and we have healthy, happy staff and students. The review column, it allows us to make improvements to either pivot or cancel what we're doing or continue it. Like I say, it's cyclical, so we can repeat the process and improve those um, those options each time. On the next slides you will see another poll. There's the first one with so much fun. So out of the four core challenges that we've outlined, which is the top challenge that you foresee facing in your organisation? Now think about the user story as well when you fill this out and if Charlotte just goes to the, the next slides you'll just see a reminder of what those are and probably if you get to get up the poll I'm sure they're on there anyway. And also just say there's um, quite a lot of you that have joined after the beginning. Um, so just to um, repeat what I said, if you've got any questions or comments at all, please use the chat box. Um, and we are recording the session as well. And we'll get to your questions um, at the end of the session, which will probably be in about 20 minutes. So I can just get this poll up. Oh, bear with me. Here we go. Oh, no, not that one, apologies. Here we go. You should see that now on your screen. Mm. So I don't know if our viewers can see this, but Sam, Mike and I can see the voting as it's happening and the lines between all the options are going like this. <laughs> so everyone's obviously got different things going on. Yeah, there is there's a lot of competition actually. We, I, I was imagining seeing a one clear kind of um, front runner, um, but clearly there's um, uh, there's people have identified concerns and potential challenges around social distancing, the phasing staggering challenge, and the on-site challenge as well. Less so the environmental and well-being challenge as well, which is more of a soft issue. 
Okay. Right, I will publish the results now. Drum roll, please. Okay, so social distancing challenge obviously um, is the main one. Um, I guess when you look at social distancing, um, all of them kind of feed into each other, but social distancing um, and phasing staggering and on-site equally um, as important. Environment and wellbeing, thank you to the two people who voted for that one. Um, I guess it's not, you know, the other, the other concerns are more pressing. Um, but I guess through what Sam has taken you through with the tools and the framework, um, you know, we can look at those challenges as well. So we can sort of use the framework and the tools to um, put this challenge in perspective. So the, you know, COVID related, but it doesn't mean to say that the kinds of things that we do and the way that we can work um, can't look at um, the environment and well-being as well. Great. So just one last slide from me and I'll hand over to Mike. So yeah, at the midway point, we just want to remind you of some of the salient points. So half of people are planning to change their commuting habits after lockdown. Are you ready for that? And as we've just talked about, what are your core challenges? Um, we have a good idea of what those are now. Do you have an appropriate framework in place? And do you have the right partners and tools to help you plan and deliver effectively? So this sounds like a, a really good time to hand over to our partners and friends at Ariva. So over to you, Mike. Thank you very much and uh, thanks for the really useful insight and overview there, really, really interesting. What I'm going to just run through for the next 10-15 minutes or so is um, a, a bit of an overview of the bus industry as a whole, but uh, how we've sort of coped with it, if you like, as a reaver uh, and some of the tools and some of the things that we're looking at now, particularly in relation to the education sector. So just pre sort of COVID really, if you like, just to set a bit of background, there's quite a lot of traction growing for the bus sector, particularly uh, publicly backed by high level government ministers, including the prime minister. And it was really, really pleasing to see a number of um, education providers utilizing public networks a lot more. Um, that might be if, even at primary level for trips out, secondary, you know, tapping into the existing network there and also some of the devolved areas. So for example, Manchester, um, they were really, really keen to promote free travel for 16 to 18 year olds. So I, I suppose really this came at a really, a time where we were expecting, you know, the bus sector to start growing in terms of the patronage, particularly in relation to young people. Uh, but obviously since then, there's been a number of changes, which obviously we've had to re uh, react to. So we could just skip to the next slide, please. So during the early stages of lockdown, very similar to a lot of businesses, sectors, um, there was a huge amount of things we had to do in a short space of time. And I suppose this has really, really, really helped us, I suppose, learn uh, in the first instance over what we can do in the future to put it right. So as you can see on the screen there, there's quite a few um, important uh, passenger announcements we had to um, push out. We stripped the network back to around about 50% at that time. So 50% of our services were running. Um, we also, as, a, as an industry, it's no surprise, there was support given by the government to keep the buses running. Um, so without that, if I'm perfectly honest, I'm not sure where we would be today, not just ourselves, but the other operators outside of London. So within a short space of time, we had to really, really think about a, what we're going to do and where, and B, how we communicate with our passengers and customers uh, on that note. You could just, next slide, please. So as of where we are now, uh, as an industry and as ourselves, we increased our services to around about 60 to 70% from the 1st of June, and that was England only. Things are working slightly differently in Wales, if you're based from there, which you'll be aware of in line with some of the things that are not in place over there yet or are in place. Um, what we're doing next as a next phase, if you like, is um, increasing our service levels towards the end of June, early July. I'd expect those to go to around about 70 to 85%, depending on um, A, how services are running from the 15th of June, uh, and B, also the capacity on them. So for example, what we're doing with some of the services at the moment is duplicating certain journeys 
on certain times of the day. So putting a second bus out there to fulfill the demand. As Charlotte mentioned, there are limits at the moment on buses. Um, so a single decker, um, the maximum we can get on at any one time is at 11. The average prior to that was 45 seats plus standing. So it's a huge drop um, based on what we were used to before and what, what your students and staff would have been used to. And double deckers is a maximum of 20. And the average prior was about 70 to 75 plus standing. Even if social distancing measures are uh, reduced to a, a, a metre, the capacity can't increase that that much. I think it's around about 10 to 15, depending on the fleet. So even then, um, within our industry, it, it might not see, you know, an influx of more passengers on a bus at any one time. So I think there's a real, I suppose, thinking to do, especially with the education sector on how we can work with you to get that right really for September and understand what your needs are and try and map, you know, map that to what we're doing out, out on the network. And as you'll be aware that from the 15th from this week, um, face coverings are mandatory on public transport. There are certain groups of people that are exempt, so people with health conditions uh, and people that are under the age of 11, but obviously for who we're talking to here today, you know, the majority of your students will have to potentially wear face coverings if they're back in September. So again, we've put a load of guidance out there over the last week or so relating to how students and the general public can um, travel on those services and what they need to do. Just skip through to the next slide, please. So just on safety, um, as a sector, I've been in this sector now for just over three years. Um, it's always been heavily prioritised on safety, um, passenger and drivers and measuring, you know, all kinds of different things around that. And that's been obviously the same for the COVID restrictions that have come in. So on the left hand side, you'll see some of the imagery that we're portraying to our customers at the moment around where they need to sit, uh, how they need to sit. Uh, there's some things around you know, if they're traveling from the same household, they can sit together, um, you know, not facing uh, directly opposite each other and no standing. And then the bus full signage, which I'll come on to shortly, but there are measures in place where um, whilst the vehicle is out in service, how we're managing that, which I'll show in a second. Alongside that, obviously what we've had to do internally now is ensure that we've got, you know, an extensive cleaning of fleet, both when it's out on the road, and also when it gets back in. Um, and there's all kinds of things around what we're offering to staff. So all the staff receive hand, hand sanitizer, um, face masks if they want to, there's no requirement for the drivers at the moment to wear those, um, but they can if they want to. And then there's really strict guidelines within the depots as well. And within our uh, ticket machines, it's called Ticketer. Um, what we're able to do from the back office is pull through how the demand and how, how that's looking on a daily basis. So as I said before about the um, duplicating services, what we're able to see on a typical day is how many people are boarding at one point and at what time. So that's how we've been really fluid to the situation at the moment in regards to, you know, trying to make sure people aren't left on the side of the road because obviously that's not what we want. Um, so that's how we're sort of uh, following the internal processes as well from our end. And then, yeah, just as I said uh, previously around the bus full, so you'll see on the left there a typical display for one of our services up in Merseyside. So if the bus has got capacity, uh, you'll see that signage on the left. If the bus is full um, and that is measured based on the ticket machine um, and how many people are on the bus at any one time, the sign um, drops down on the right hand sign sorry, saying the bus is full. So at that point, um, it's a one-off, uh, one-on basis. So from a customer point of view, that's really, really um, challenging for us to get across that information, both, you know, before that was, you know, the capacity limits were in place and also ongoing and managing, managing customer expectations. What we are doing, um, which will be in place very soon, is on the app, is it will show capacity on a live basis. So if your students and staff are using services and it's in our area, you'll be able to look on the app to see if there's, um, you know, how full that bus is at any one time uh, and where it is as well as usual. 
So I've just pulled this from our website in terms of the bus full sign aspect. So you'll see here what we've uh, portrayed to our uh, passengers. So as I said, the bus will only stop when people want to get off uh, and it's a one-off, one-on basis. Um, we are asking passengers to, you know, sort of look at look after each other really and prioritizing those who need to travel more urgently than you key workers included um and obviously the the rules or, or the guidance that we're passing out to customers is around wearing the face coverings uh carrying the hand sanitizer with you trying to keep the windows open so the vent so the ventilation can pass through um we are um saying to pay by contactless or via m ticket app and if people want to pay by cash, there's a no change policy in place at the moment. If there are any, you know, there is excess change at the end of that duty that has been, been donated to charity. And, you know, the general rules about not standing next to the driver um, and keeping two metres away from people at bus stops is, is we're, we're trying to push that across as well. The bus stops, we've, we did have a question about that beforehand today. Um, the bus stops are managed by local authorities or local transport authorities. So we're working closely with them to, you know, ensure that that guidance is also sent out, but that's self-regulated, which, which is another challenge in itself as well, in terms of how the public are, I suppose, self-regulating that at times. So I think that's a real challenge for, you know, the, the, the country at the moment in terms of, um, in terms of how people are behaving and, you know, working together to try and get on and off public transport. Let's skip through, please. So I've just pulled out some considerations here that, you know, you may be already thinking of, or you may be already doing, or you might not have thought about, and this is, you know, why we wanted to have a chat with you guys today. So, um, Charlotte and Sam mentioned about having a good understanding of student and staff locations and all possible options. I think that's really, really important for all sectors at the moment, um, especially where there's mass, you know, um, people coming in and out. So not just public transport, all forms of travel. So whether that be cycling, walking, train, lift sharing, etc. I think, you know, some of our partners already do this, but I'm not sure if all of our partners are doing this or all potential partners are doing that so i think that as a start of a 10 that's probably you know the, the most important starting point i know some schools and colleges and unis have already done this but that's considering ways of staggering start and end times um i know that some are already looking at this for september which is again a bit of an unknown at the moment but as a bus operator that's really really important for us to know that information um i.e if you are making changes and it's on one of the networks tell us um and then we can try and work with you to get that right so for example one of the unis that we work with there's quite a high volume that goes in at the moment in the morning if that needs to change then we can work with that particular university to try and accommodate that as best as we can moving forward um I would say speak to local authorities, as we said, the bus operators, travel providers, all kinds of different stakeholders um, over how you can work with us to get things as, as right and ready for September. Again, some of it's a bit of an unknown, but the better we are prepared as, as transport operators, you know, the better it is for your students and staff. Um, and I think, you know, some of the things that, you know, some of you will already be doing is, is uh, providing as much information as possible on your web pages, social media, open evenings and remote e open evenings. So some of the examples that we're doing at the moment with our partners is providing, you know, a couple of slides on, <clears throat> excuse me, travel in and out from their premises, um, which is going into their remote evening, remote open evening packs. Um, if I'm honest, some of the schools and colleges that, uh, that, that, promote their services don't really have transport or active travel on there or very you know very limited information so i suppose really about thinking about how you can attract new students might be worth thinking about now um one consideration to make might be around considering how you run your own buses or minibuses um so if you've got your own minibuses that you might be picking up um you know students in the morning on behalf of parents if social distancing is still in place by September, and if it's the same now, a minibus max capacity is four. So how will you manage that one? 
yourselves. Um, and I think the cost-effective ticketing options is worth, worth thinking about as well. So i.e. how you can pass it on to parents and students in regards to, you know, bursary students. So i.e. schools or colleges, you know, buying the tickets on behalf of the students, but also the most cost-effective ticket that the parents or students can buy themselves. There's loads of different options out there that operators promote. And again, it might be the case where there might be more people looking at, you know, ways they can save money through all of this as well, especially the parents if they're, you know, struggling with jobs or whatever. So again, speak to operators about how they can help. And as I've said before, certain premises might need to think about their staffing travel a lot more than they did before, especially if the car parking spaces are quite limited. So I mentioned before about good practice, and this is one thing we've put into place with one of our partners up, up in the Wirral. Um, it's, it's quite simple, it's quite in, you know, visual. So this just shows all the campuses that they operate and all of the bus routes which go in and out and past those different campuses. So again, I mentioned about the remote open evenings. These are some of the things with the way that we do with some of our partners already. Seen some really good examples um, that uh, you know, colleges do themselves, especially around all forms of travel. So Wakefield College in, in Yorkshire, they've got a really, really good leaflet on, you know, all forms of travel, including cycling, walking, lift sharing, bus, etc. Um, so again, going back to the, you know, promoting all forms of way of getting to your locations might be something that you want to look at after this today. So just a couple more things from ourselves here really just I suppose other ways that we can help so we've I've talked a lot about route, route and network scoping um, what I would say is as I said at the start reducing the network is giving us the opportunity to think about that network in the long term and if you are on our routes at the moment our commercial routes for example probably worth having a conversation around what your plans are and how we can help with that, especially if you've got a high volume of people coming in. As I've said, definitely worth reviewing travel information issued to students, staff and parents. Um, if you do have minibuses and things like that, where you're thinking, how are we going to cope with that? Perhaps there's an opportunity to speak to operators over how they can come in and help with the short term. Uh, we've been quite responsive, helping, you know, not, not the education sector at the moment because of the numbers, but more private sector employers because they were running their own money buses. So we're helping them with supplying larger ones and a driver in the short term, for example. Um, <clears throat> advising on content improvement and signposting through to stakeholders of how they can travel safe. And I suppose if they have to use ways of getting in, what confidence can we give them to ensure that they're confident that the service that they're going to be on is safe and practical. As I've said, the bespoke and val best value ticketing options. So what are they? How can you work with operators to push that through to your various stakeholders? Um, and as I said, we, we're a large business and we do own um, a company called Areva Bus and Coach. So we can actually get coaches in and, and provide those to different businesses and diff different sectors as well. And one of the services that we do offer is looking at the full management of bus provision for education partners so that's not just looking at commercial services that's actually saying right what do you need where do you need it and how can we help you um, to supply that really and sometimes that's the case where we supply the whole lot or sometimes we're finding other transport operators to come in and supply that for you as well just uh, the final thoughts from me so just, I suppose, just closing remarks from ourselves, really, uh, as, as bus operators. Um, I suppose, what transport considerations have you made for September, if any? Can you afford not to? And what would be the outcome if you do or don't? So just some final thoughts from myself, really. And thank you for listening this morning to, to myself. Thank you, Mike. That was great. Um, really, really interesting. Um, good to get some insights. I'm sure everyone will agree. Um, so that pretty much wraps up um, the what we're going to go through today. Um, so to tie it all together, you know, we've gone through um, what we see um, in the sector and what we're seeing um, in transport um, through lockdown. 
and we've gone through some tools and frameworks from LiftShare that we think can be applied to lots of challenges, but specifically the challenges um, that we've outlined today. Um, and Mike's taken us through, um, you know, what they're looking at Arriva and Arriva and considerations from the bus um, from the bus network. So, I guess our call to action would be, um, you know, we'd welcome a conversation um, with any of you that are interested or have some of the challenges um, for us to, you know, see what our, how our tools could help you. Specifically in relation to bus routes, it's kind of getting that understanding of where your staff and students live potentially. Um, and we can work hand in hand with Ariba, um, who we partner with, um, to, to work out the best options for you. So, um, if we take some time to now go through some comments and questions, I can get the box up. There we go. Okay. Some questions in the chat. So this is from Jay Winsani. So we might not be able to answer all of these questions now, but even if I read some of them out, it's kind of things for you all to consider. So, um, Jay Winsani, I represent the college and we won't know who enrolls until the end of August. How do we plan for this? Do you want me to take that? Yes, go on, Mike. Yeah, so I, I saw that one as you were talking before, so I made some notes. Um, I suppose, yeah, that's difficult. Um, However, what we've looked at before with our partners, um, particularly around colleges, is possibly basing on historic trends. So going back over a couple of years in relation to generally where students were coming in from. Um, if the other thing we've looked at with colleges, if they're targeting a certain area and there's no routes, that's how we've helped colleges um, for September. So for example, there's one in the Northeast that we're putting on a new service for from September because they've managed to attract, they know that they're attracting the numbers now. Possibly birth rates, I made a note. So are birth rates gonna be spiking? So therefore do you expect a, an increase there? And I suppose you're probably already doing this now, but what's the feeling gonna be like from the feeder schools that you normally get students from um, that maybe haven't got six forms and they, you know, they're going to college. So as a as a bus operator, I think that the first one I mentioned was probably the best starting point, and that's to look at what have been the trends over the last few years, um, and where our current net. Here's how we would do it: we'd look at the current network and how that currently fits. I hope that sort of answers it. Yeah, I guess from our perspective, in terms of um, how we work we can work quite quickly. So once data becomes available, um, we can run that through our tools quite quickly. And my routes can take a little bit longer to plan to get them um, made official or whatever the, the proper term is when you're looking yeah. at routes. Just um, on, so sorry. No, it's okay, yeah. I was just gonna say, just in the current situation, we can register routes a lot quicker at the moment. Um, you know, within, sort of three to five days really um, at the moment historically to register a new route um, it's taken 56 days which I, I can't get my head around personally if I'm honest but at the moment because of the situation which is probably a positive actually to come out of this if anything is we can be a lot more responsive now obviously the sooner the better in terms of knowing where things might be heading in terms of demand um, but as I said before, we've been quite, re we are being quite reactive to where people are, you know, exp you know, needing the demand at the moment. So yeah, in terms of registering a new route, that's quicker. And I, I would expect that to still be in place for a number of months, if not, you know, for a long term, really, potentially there might be some changes on legislation that comes of this. So if we have the data via somewhere like LiftShare that, you know, that, that we're working with, we could be quite responsive to that. Okay, thanks Mike. Um, so this is from Lynn Ridden. Will there be more, this is I guess one for you Mike as well, uh, will there be more buses on routes? We have lots of students use public transport, some of our students have to get two buses to get to school and this will massively affect students coming to school. Um, in answer to that, will there be more buses on routes? Yes, if the demand is there. So as I said, the 
the way that we're doing it at the moment is duplicating the services. I think if there's specific examples where, like for yourself, where we need to look at how we do things, I think it's probably worth a conversation to find out which bus routes we're talking about, where potentially they're coming from, and what measures we could put in place before September to gear with that. And also, as we said before, what are you changing your times and volumes that are coming in each day? So it's a difficult one to answer now because we don't really know where we're going to be, both from your end and our end, I suppose. But as I said previously, we're already doing that as such in terms of understanding now where the demand is coming from. And that's something we'll be continuing to do with you know your support as well if, if you you know want to want to mention uh, want to get in touch with us about that aspect okay. i'm going through these just um from when they were asked this is more of a quick one for you mike from anna ramsey can we get details of who we need to contact if we in our local area <laughs> uh that would be myself so my email address is on the end slide there so it's a starting point anna come through to me and depending on what the query is, I'll be able to put you in the right place. There's actually a couple of questions in the Q&A as well, which probably are best for Mike to answer as well. All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Nick Hill, is the bus full notice exclusive to Arriva or universal across providers? Yeah, it's universal. Um, obviously each operator works slightly differently, so, all I can say on that aspect is on which operators are really, um, operating in your area, check their, uh, the way that we've got it, we've got a coronavirus page set up. So arivabus.co.uk forward slash coronavirus, everything relating to timetables, um, social distancing displays is all on there and also on our social media. So again, just, just double check with the operators, but also possibly the local authority as well. That's right. And this is from Deborah Kapage. Um, is it realistic to expect there will be resources available to support all schools to plan effectively considering the tight time style? Um, so I can start on this one. I suppose it depends on where, what, what's going on. So I know a lot of schools are looking to go back in the last couple of weeks before summer, some um, September, some even January in staggered phases. So it depends, but from our perspective, sort of working through the resources and the sort of shown, we can work pretty quickly. Um, I guess it's up to the, and this is, you know, maybe where the challenge is, it's in gathering the data and, and having that the sort of some semblance of a plan um, on, on your side. But we can work quite quickly, as Mike has said, um, with the changing times um, and everything that's going on with COVID, uh, it sounds like, um, the way that you know the bus and public um, public networks are operating has become a little bit more agile. Um, so yes, it will be it will be tight in some instances, I'm sure. Um, but we're we're quite agile as a Arriva, um, and there's lots of little things um, that can be done. So even if it's you know looking at where your staff and um, staff and students live and be able to say well actually look at all these people you could act, you know we could get walking we could try and promote cycle schemes that might take a lot of pressure off the public network your parking etc etc so even little things like that um in terms of understanding the data um and implementing things it you know we don't have to do everything at once um, but there's lots of little things that you can do by just understanding the data that can make quite a big impact um, and yeah, like Mike said, they're, they're quite nimble and agile. So, um, there, you know, there are things that can be done. Uh, let's just look in the comments box and see if there's any more questions. I think we've got one from Nick. Do you want to read that one out, Mike? Yes, it's a great question. Should travel by public transport in September not increase to the same as last year? How will bus companies maintain the commercial viability of these services? It's not likely that support payments uh, will continue in September and with social, if social distancing continues and demand rises, how will bus operators manage as there will not be enough buses and drivers to cope with the demand? <laughs> that is a fantastic question um, and I don't think I have the full answer there 
if I'm honest with you at this moment in time, I suppose what what we're looking at, and as I've said before, is where the demand is fitting on each route at the moment down to route level. So for example, in line with our ramp up, we've taken the decision to increase um, increase some services more so than others. So i.e. some of them have stayed at a certain level every 30 minutes because there hasn't been that demand and some of them are going up in fact in, uh, back to what they were before. It's a really, really difficult one, I think, and something that we probably don't know the full answer to. And yeah, commercially, um, it's a real challenge as well. Um, you know, obviously, if you're managing a shop, let's say that had 100 customers a day, you know, it's similar to us. We, we can't fill as many people on a bus at the moment, which commercially becomes a bit of a challenge. So <clears throat> hence the reason really why we wanted to sort of flag this with the sector today and, and wider. How can we work with you to get it right, really, and, and make sure that bus services don't stop because that's the last thing we want for communities and, and people out in out in you know in all areas is is having to make some really tough decisions around what buses are running and where um so I, I know that doesn't really answer it but that's probably the best i can give at this moment in time in terms of um uh, in terms of the kind of the commercial element as well i was just reading an article um in which the urban transport group have have called for the government to, to fund the additional costs of providing school transport during COVID 19 social distancing um uh, so uh, I, I think initially we would obviously say um uh, let, let's work from the day so let's understand the demands but but clearly there is obviously a gap that's going to need to be filled yeah yeah, thanks, Mike and Sam. And Mike, yeah, I was just thinking that it's, you know, the purpose of this session is, well, it's thinking of challenges, but so that we're talking. So operators um, and providers like the share and Arriva, we're talking to you. We're talking about your challenges because if we, you know, if we don't talk the <laughs> problems, um, they're not going to get resolved. So I don't, you know, I think with every industry at the moment, everyone's kind of, um, I don't want to say muddling through. But, um, you know, we're, this is something unprecedented. I don't like to use the word unprecedented because everyone's using it, but it really is. And, um, you know, the best thing that we can do is try to adapt and work together. So um, hopefully one of the outcomes of this session is that we'll be able to talk to more of you now and going forwards, um, whether we can, you know, help right now or not. Um, but it's just good to have that dialogue. So um, I just check to see if there's any more comments or questions. I don't think there are. There, there's one more. Oh, there is? Oh. Shannon. Yeah. I can't see it. Do you want to... Do you want me to read it out? Yes, please, Mike. Yeah, so there's a question in from uh, Shannon, which is a great question again. I understand that the fees for annual student tickets in RA have not increased this year due to the current climate. Why has this not decreased, considering buses are not running at capacity to better reflect the usage by students? Um, so in terms of increases um we took the decision not to increase prices for september um certainly for you know the annual um uh, tickets the, the decrease in prices um quite simply you know uh, as one of the questions came in we're going to have less people on buses and you know to try and get the balance of customer satisfaction versus you know even getting to a point where we're breaking evening, uh, breaking even, sorry, is a really, really difficult balance. One thing we are looking at, um, which we are considering uh, bringing in for September, is a more flexible ticket offer. Um, and that might be something on the lines of Carne products. So for example, students and passengers being able to um, purchase rather than a longer term ticket like bundles of tickets in like volumes of 10 20 example etc so for example if they're only going to be in like say one or two days a week now rather than commit to a longer period ticket they'll be able to buy those in bundles so it's a really really difficult balance to get right pricing um, and it's a really emotive subject um, but i suppose really that was the decision we came to really trying to get the balance right of our running costs versus demand versus more flexible tickets in the future. Great, 
Thank you, Mike. Um, just a comment from Sally Castles. The new voucher scheme looks good. Thank you. There we go. Um, all right, I think, yeah, I seem to be blind to lots of the, that, um, that's all the questions. Um, so thank you so, so much for, um, for registering and attending today. Um, we're really glad to have seen so many of you on. We hope you've got some value out of it. Um, you can see our contact details um, on the screen there. So if you've got any questions at all, if you want to set up a session with us to, to talk through your challenges um, with either us and Ariva, or just you want to talk about um, buses and the bus network, which seems to be a very popular conversation <laughs> today, obviously, um, then obviously reach out to Mike. Um, we will be sending around a... Um, be an email coming around tomorrow um, with my details on so that will be there and yeah thank you thank you so so much and we hope to speak with lots of you soon thank you take care everyone